Attack! Ceasefire, ceasefire. What's going on, guys? Welcome back. Everybody is aware as much as we can be of what's happening over in Israel. And we thought we would take this time to uh, sit down and do a little shop talk and discuss some points that we feel that's important. Um, there's so many things to consider, but the primary thing that we want to really focus on is the importance of of the people of the country. Your government is not going to protect you. Law enforcement are not going to protect you. They do what they can. If you look at Israel, Israel's response time was hours uh, before they actually started getting tanks and things into the fight. You're talking a couple days. It's not the fact that Israel does not believe the people are not important. There's just a higher priority there, and that's the the protection of the country as a whole. In the meantime, a lot of people died. So um, I don't know about you guys, but um, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I think that had the Israeli populace been armed like we are here in the States, that uh, they would have decimated Hamas the moment that they stepped foot in the country. That's just flat line. I mean, if they would have had the tools necessary to defend themselves it wouldn't even have been a fight it's it, i mean look i mean from the videos i've seen it's all <laughs> pretty basic stuff from you know what they're actually doing yeah and i think it's one of those situations to where you don't even have to necessarily be really skilled when you come together with a significantly greater force their only option are is to fight and die or to retreat and i don't watch a lot of it but i think israel actually at some point started to arm the citizens mm -hmm. is um, that true i haven't seen anything i did read uh a excerpt uh from facebook where a family member was telling the story of there are two family members that were killed by Hamas who locked their two 10-month-old twins into the safe room, which is required by uh, law in Israel uh, to have in new buildings. Um, and then they proceeded to get into a couple-hour-long fight, uh, gunfight with Hamas, killing seven of them before inevitably they were killed. Um, and their two twins spent 13 hours uh, in that safe room until their family was able to arrive and get them to safety. So there are some instances where we see civilians fighting back, but if there are firearms in civilians' hands, it's in very, very, very limited numbers. So I think the first talking point, or the real one, is understanding our position in the world. Obviously, it can change. Um, we can be assaulters at times, okay? But we also have to take in consideration that we have to be defensive at times, too. So, uh, for me, and this is mostly towards you, my kids are grown. You know, I know 100% that I can put uh, guns in my kids' hands and they can protect the home as much as they can unless it's overran and, and that goes towards me you having a wife and a young a very young daughter who's not that skilled your your initial priority is probably going to not run out in the streets and uh, be an assaulter it's going to be a defensive fighter of the home and maybe you know your close neighbors what are your thoughts on that yeah i think it'd be a good idea just to hunker down well you're uh That's a hard one. That is. Hard it's one. very hard because our natural instincts are well, we have to protect the country to protect our family. But at the end of the day, if you look at the Civil War, when they started finding out where the families were, they started killing the women and the children, burning them inside and stuff. It's like, holy crap, what do we do? You know. So here'd be a question then: If let's say Hamas was coming down the streets of any of the big cities or anything, and you can see them coming down your neighborhood, and you know that. They don't know that you're in there yet. They're walking past houses. Would you actually engage as they're walking by, or would you let them? 
pass. That's like a good, as a defensive situation of only fire upon when you're getting fired that's at. That's a good question. Or so, a hundred percent depends on the situation. Uh, regardless of what your skill set is, you got to understand that we're we're hunkered down at a home, okay. And if their mindset is to assault and they have a large number, you're going to lose that fight. So, my obligation is I got to look at the situation. Are they killing right now? If they're just marching down the street to something, it would not behoove me to go ahead and start that assault, even if I'm by myself, right? We got to pick and choose our battles, right? I can be more beneficial to this fight by um, allowing them to potentially pass and then coming together with another group later on. Mm -hmm. I got my family and stuff and they're done. I'm definitely not going to pull the trigger. But if they're going house to house and pulling people out and raping, this is this. What is, do you do? And that's what you see in Israel. These people aren't just going to be going down the streets, just going past houses. That's not realistic. They're going into these houses. And realistically, with as big as our neighborhoods are, they would probably just set them on fire. That's 100 percent. So my personal opinion is, one, you should, you know, if you are, you know, I don't know if you're cool with your neighbors or not cool with your neighbors. If you like them, don't like them. At that point, it doesn't really matter. You have one common goal, one common enemy. Kill them. Y'all stay alive. Right. And I think it's something that every neighborhood needs to orchestrate among themselves of, hey, you know, if something like this happens, we need to have fallback positions, if you will, or counterattack measurements places where we can funnel these individuals in and where their numbers don't mean anything if you have a lot of numbers that doesn't mean anything put them in a, if you can herd them people into a cul-de-sac you got people up all, all on the roofs or coming through alleys and you trap them it doesn't matter how many people they have they're trapped so it's all about how you go about it and obviously you know how many people you have if you have the capabilities of doing it and, and that's a big point is the, the truth of humanity is very simple. Hold your hold your breath. I want you to hold your breath until you pass out. You can't do it. You're going to take a breath. Your natural instinct is to live. So look at history. How many people actually have chosen to sign up to go to war or battle or just have that fierce mindset over the typical populace? So um, getting your neighbors and stuff to one in the right mindset to even do that and two to train something like that is almost impossible so <clears throat> i man it's a it's a hard topic but here is another one we've seen over the last five years where a lot of prior military guys have came out and started this larping idea of civilians running and gunning and for me personally i feel the people who do that, they have no current purpose. So when they see somebody else not serving, it becomes agitating to them and they go out on this banner of civilians. But the truth is, even as a former Navy SEAL, how much can I do? If you were to take all of the combat veterans, people who can actually fight, you know, we're not going to be able to handle any significant large force. We're going to get decimated. It's just. You can firepower can only do so much. Training can only do so much. So, at the end of the day, our country's safety falls back on all of us at different and, levels. And I feel like, and I've said this before, uh, I think actually on the last little talk that we did, um, I feel like a large majority of the military members that do go out, you know, and bash civilians for wearing armor, kit, and training, they were in this exclusive club, right? And that was their purpose. That was their sole purpose was be a warrior, be a fighter for the military. Well, then they got out of the military. They don't have a purpose anymore. And then they see civilians going out and wearing the same stuff they were wearing and doing, you know, training the same stuff they were training. I feel like they get offended by that because... They do. You know, I, when I first got out and I didn't have my purpose, I lost that identity. It was offensive at first, and it took some time to work through that. But at the end of the day... Um, Another big topic is, you know, this idea because I have a million dollars behind me that other people can't invest the time and effort and achieve those same things, which isn't true. Look at your skill set. You've been training a long time. You don't have all the knowledge that I do or the experience, but your skill set is 100% regardless if they get offended or not. It is special forces level. I mean, 
Now, your physicality as far as your physical training and stuff, you don't train to that level. But your overall firearm safety, assaulting, defensive training is that of special forces. And to be honest with you, it probably exceeds that. But there's don't be air. Yeah, yeah no. that go to your head. No, there's a lot that goes into it. And that's what I told you the other day when I said, you know, I've been doing this practically all my life. I'm not saying I have, you know, this everything that a navy seal has 100 percent. i don't i don't have all the tactics built in i don't have you know when to apply this certain tactic here because this makes more sense than this tactic. i don't you know have all of that but i feel like i said the other day as far as the skills go the shooting goes and some of the more basic tactics that will help you in a gunfight i'm i've got down 100 percent so everybody obviously knows how we feel about armor and battle belts and stuff like that. Based on, you know, your experience and what we just saw happen in Israel, um, what are your thoughts on armor and a battle belt for the possibility of incorporating it into your future training and loadout? I would say absolutely. Like if it comes down to people walking down the street and taking, going house to house, chopping off babies' heads and stuff, like I would want to be completely decked out as much as as much as I could be, and be ready for. Even though with my skill set, I'll probably get taken advantage of pretty damn quick. But at least I would be able to put in the effort to right to not go down without a fight. I'm not. I take a couple of them with you. Yeah, exactly. So here's here's an interesting thing, and and having a battle belt and armor and all that stuff would only aid in taking a couple of them more with a couple more of them with me before anything yeah. were to happen. Hopefully win the fight, but yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, that, I think that's the, uh, I think where a lot of people get lost on that is, is they look at people like me or people who is really skilled and it's like, well, if I'm not at that level, I'm not able to be any help, which isn't true. You look at the army, you know, the army used to put 30, they calculated what the losses were going to be. And they just said, okay, we need 30% more. 30% are not even going to make it out of the plane, you know, basically, or excuse me, 30% won't make it to the ground. 30, the planes are going to get shot down. Their parachutes won't open. They're going to get shot or hit by other planes or artillery on the ground before they even get to the ground. They're going to break their legs. So 30% automatically will never even get into the fight. So we're going to put 30% more people, mm -hmm. you know, into this fight. And that that's how they determine uh, what their success rate or how, how they were going to be successful. But the point of that is if you look at every group, there's always a weaker link and they can still be just as effective. Mm -hmm. right? So what I would say to everybody is if regardless of where you are, uh, what shape you're in, what your skill set is, you can be of assistance. But obviously, again, our overall goal is to live and see the future beyond this. So that's where our physical capabilities, our training comes in. I will say that a unit or a team is only as strong as its weakest link. Now, and I'm not saying that to bash anybody. I'm just saying that that's just the God's honest truth. But in saying that, there's also another saying that most gunfights are won with the basics. So if you got the basics rock solid built in, you don't need to be all some Navy SEAL level operator. You just need... Put the dot on the target, pull the trigger. Did you hit where you're aiming? Cool, good, you got 100%. it. Let's, let's kill bad guys. That's it. It's Yeah, in most situations. Yeah. And then we get into, you know, the, the assault organized team, stuff. organized assault yeah. teams, patrolling. You got to be a little and, more dialed and in. And that's what people don't understand is they think, like, look how disorganized Israel was, for example. They think, you know, it would be this, you know, real organized like it was whenever we organized against the British in the 1700s. It's going to be very, very unconventional, small units, guerrilla warfare, attack, disappear. That's the type of fighting that will happen here, like what we see in Israel of even the army guys. You got 10, 10 dudes on a highway with two trucks fighting however many guys, you know what I mean? They, they're very small units. You don't see like Fallujah, for example, when we went in, everybody, thousands of people, just a response. They... Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the groups from Israel, like on the videos, but it hasn't been very substantial amounts of, you know, defenders. Very, no, very small groups. Well, they don't have they don't have firearms. You know, in a situation like that, small team tactics, you are going to be one more clandestine. We're going to get in. We're going to hit. We're going to get out. Yeah. But if you look at look at a, a 
a bug or something that comes in contact with an ant bed, what happens? Because they are in such large numbers, they just come out and they just decimate this thing very quickly. So there is a time and place for everything. And it's very important that I, f I feel it's important that we be well-rounded, you know, in all aspects. As a defender, as an assaulter, you know, we need armor and we need belts. Um, having this safe to where our, our empty magazines are over here and a box ammo over here, that's not going to work. You need that stuff loaded out because you saw how quick it happened. And it's, I think... People really believe that our country is so safe and protected it can't happen here. Man, this is uh, definitely should be an eye-opener for our country because we see this steady decline of what's happening here in the U.S. And um, I think humanity's biggest problem is hope. Hope. We hope that it's not going to. Well, it's cool that we don't want it to and that we hope for it, but you better be planning on it because the country itself is not prepared as a whole. And when you have a bunch of unprepared people, you're going to find that there's a lot of selfish actions that take place. Me, myself, I, my family, I don't care about you. And that's what we're going to be really dealing with is... Um, I believe that the American populace will kill more of its own than the enemy will at a given point. All they got to do is sit back and just watch us destroy ourselves like we are right now. <laughs> it's not far off from it. With that, okay, so with that being said, then we talked about armor. How many magazines? For about, obviously, as many as you can carry. So there has to be a line. When I was overseas, I carried 15 total. Mm -hmm. I carried two attached together on the rifle and the rest on the armor. Then that's not counting what I carried in my in bag. bag. But you also got to realize we were moving in a Humvee. This was not patrolling. You know, um, here in the U.S. right now, we have a lot of access to, you know, we have access to our homes. We have access to ammunition, stuff like that. If I'm out in the desert and I'm patrolling, obviously I need to take more. The last thing I want to do is run out. But the con to that is the heavier I am, the more so weight here, down I am. Here in the States, what do you recommend? Like my personal, my Minimum personal opinion six. is seven. I say seven. Minimum of six here and then one or two in the... Yeah, I say, yeah, three, at least one of the gun and maybe two on the belt. Or if you have the space to fill out your oh shit mags, then do it. Yeah. But I say minimum six to seven. Yeah. I mean, hopefully by then you've actually got some kills and been... Well, if you last that long to use all those rounds, you're doing pretty good. Yeah, in my exactly. Opinion. You're doing the chances of you lasting that long are slim, but if you do, I'll potentially what is be that? able to get my hands on another either ammo or another gun with their ammo. What is that? Three hundred rounds, something like that. Just about. What's your biggest fear in a situation like that? Having a wife and kid. Just being overran and not having enough ammo, or not having enough magazines. Like, because you can have thousands of rounds of ammo, but if you only have ten magazines, then like, if right. you get overran, then yeah. it's like belt fed, solve that issue. <laughs> <laughs> Polish the ATF. Freaking Maduce, Maduce <laughs> up in the front window. Do, 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 do. <laughs> or what are they called? The MK 19s, the freaking belt fed grenade launchers. But that is a good point, Mark though. 19, how you're yeah, saying, 19s. like, at that point, like, would it be even be worth keeping stockpiling that much ammo if something were to happen? There's going to be guns and ammo laying all over the place. Magazines. 100%. If it was locked and loaded in magazines, yes. So we got a plan and a, a mindset that, okay, my home is my FOB, my forward operating base. So I'm going to have as many supplies as I can there. I don't have a security team. I don't have everything locked down. It's just a risk that I'm willing to take. Um, I don't even know if I'm coming back if I choose to go out and fight. But if I do make it back, then I have resupply. But also the thought process is, is if I'm out there on the battlefield and I'm you know, what distance am I engaging? Because if I'm on a battlefield and I'm engaging and I kill a couple guys here, well, I'm not going to go out there 75 yards when, you know, there's potentially somebody else there. I'm just not going to risk that, you know. And that's another topic. Typical engagement distances, distances that you would see in an, in an event of something like 
a Hamas invading or something like we see in Israel? It could be more than a couple hundred yards. Yeah. If you look at any environment, even out here, you're talking no more. 250 max. 300 yards max. And even then, it's still pretty, you know, That's veg- pushing it. a lot of vegetation that your window of actually capitalizing on a kill is, is very minimal. So I would say within 200 yards. Yeah. And even inside the residential areas, you're talking. You're talking. I mean, yeah. Even in the area that we're in now, you know, being un- unincorporated, you know, typical engagement distances from either where I live or you live would be well within 100 yards. Yeah. I mean, well within, maybe even 25 yeah. in some cases. So really, as American citizens, it's not only our right, but it's our duty in order to train with with firearms. Like, it's that's part of being American is having and training with guns, but you need to take that to a different level. Don't just stand on a, a line and hit a target. Actually, put your kit on, put your battle belts on, move and run drills that are realistic because if, if, if the crap hits the fan, we're, <laughs> you're going to be wishing that you did, right? You're not going to be shooting Bambi. But at the end of the day, the Second Amendment was not made for deer hunting. It was made to protect ourselves from enemies both foreign and domestic uh our freedom came from people with guns so it's really our duty in order to train with the guns to make sure that never happens again 100 percent. well land and water you know these are recent animals or resources that we, you know we really can't get back the land and the water itself um, and if, again if you look at israel that's what the entire war is about and it's again it's only a matter of time uh, before it happens to one of the most resourced countries in the world, which is us. And uh, I think it's just uh, one thing I feel Americans and humans in general do is we take advantage and we don't appreciate what we have, that we live in this self-entitled mindset to where, you know, uh, it's our right, you know. But we do have those rights, but those rights came from many people dying on both sides to ensure that, um, that's not infringed upon. So uh, the duty is paramount. It's more of a responsibility. Objects can be replaced. Buildings can be replaced. Lives cannot. Okay. But so it's, I mean, it's more of a responsibility that I feel. It's like if you buy a gun and you don't know how to use it, I just want to smack some people sometimes. But it's just, you know, armor up and train. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Have a good day and God bless.